Great, thanks, Rose. Evening, everybody. Um, this is always it's always a tough brief um, doing this because there's there's something decidedly uh, strange about other people's holiday snaps, aren't there? Um, and it's quite indulgent to get to spend time reviewing your holiday with other people. But I'm going to try and give you a flavour for what it was like to travel on the Globebusters um, Ace to Ace expedition back it's 2019 now and i start just by making the point that um i'm not an exceptional rider by any stretch of the imagination I, i'm um i've been riding probably well since I, I rode when i was a kid came back probably 15 years ago and i'm um i'm an iam member i'm a, a national observer with london advanced motorcyclists but i'm not a i'm not a hardcore expedition rider i've toured for probably 10 years couple of weeks at a time been to some interesting places doing that but never done anything like this before and one of the big messages I think from this is that if I can do it uh, anybody can do it so let's just think a little bit about what it actually is I'm just trying to see Jerry can I get rid of the bar Jerry at the bottom so I can see the slide better don't worry okay so what it was it's a the Globebusters um, Ace to Ace expedition, 88 days, uh, 13,000 miles, 19 countries, slept in 64 different beds. The uh, the stats go on and on. And Globebusters, why Globebusters? Well, this guy, uh, Kevin Sanders, many, if not all of you will have heard of him. Often I've heard him described as the um, the big daddy of motorcycle overlanding. He and his wife uh, hold a whole series of Guinness World Records and Globebusters have a great reputation for organising these trips, particularly into more difficult parts of the world. So I I would class Kevin in a way as, as my hero. And his his favourite saying is when it gets tough, you've got to remember it's not a holiday, it's an adventure. And Julia, who also came along, Julia's Kevin's wife, she's the brains of the op of the operation in terms of the organisation and so on that goes into it, which is no small task when you think of the difficulties of getting bikes into uh, and out of Tibet and so on. The trip, there were, I think if you add that lot up, there were 20 riders on 19 bikes. It's sort of self-selecting. Um, the vast majority are middle-aged men, but not all. Um, variety of, of different nationalities, as you can see there. The tw there were 20 riders or 20 people, 19 bikes, one couple from New Zealand, were uh, from Australia, were riding two up, which is also no mean achievement. Variety of different bikes, as you'd expect, particularly being IAM members. Um, the, there's not a lot of imagination goes into selecting bikes for trips like this. So the vast majority of them are either GSAs or GSs bunch of tigers, particularly because Globebusters now are sponsored by Triumph. One guy um, actually attempted to get a Multistrada all the way from London to Beijing, and actually it made it. It had a few, um, few incidents along the way, but it made it. And I chose to do it quite differently. So I'm also, uh, I also have no imagination, so I'm a GS rider as well. But I decided to take a Honda CB500X uh, full rally raid conversion uh, on it, but I wanted to take something different and something something simpler and lighter. And perhaps I'll talk about a little bit later about whether or not it was a good decision. You start off probably six months in advance, starting to plan for the thing. You've got all the issues about what are you going to wear. Um, I, I chose a laminated suit, a shoe bath helmet, um, adventure boots rather than full uh, motocross boots just because you do need to wear them every day for three months and you need to be able to walk around in them and then some various pairs of rucker gloves and so on the big question though is what do you wear the rest of the time and where the hell are you going to put it all one of globebusters big mantras is uh, you're not like you're not allowed to take a top box and you've got to carry everything yourself so although there's a support truck all of your luggage you have to um, carry so you, it is, it's the classic thing. If you lay it all out, you throw half of it away and you do that twice. And actually you still end up with too much stuff. But eventually you move on from clothing. The, the list of other things you've got to think about in advance is as long as you want to 
want to make it. But the truth is that the preparation is actually part of the fun. But eventually the big day um, arrives and I, it was a date in April 2019 Richard, where we assembled. Richard, it's Rose. Are, are your slides not moved? I can't see a new slide. Oh, is it still the map? Hang on. Sorry. No, it's my fault, Rose, not because I, I'll tell you what it is. Because I can't see the notes, I'm reading my notes off it, off my iPad and I'm forgetting to move the slides. So it's sorry, my fault. Sorry, so sorry to interrupt you. No, okay. you did the right thing. You did, I'm sorry about that, guys. Incompetent presenter. So the big day arrives. A few um, a few friends come and wave you off. We even had the mayor of Brent come to wave the, uh, the wave the flag. But off we went. <laughs> me on the Honda. And that's the support truck of which more later. And so it begins. One thing that gets asked a lot that I'll, I'll just talk about for a second here is how does it actually work? If you go on a trip with 20 riders, are you riding in a crocodile from beginning to end all the time? And the answer with the, globe, the way Globebusters organise it is absolutely not. Every day you get a sheet like this. So uh, it's a set of, of route notes with um, you zero the trip meter every day. You've got the mileages and certain notes about where you need to turn off, what the map references are, what happens there, whether it's directions, whether it's things you might want to go to visit or whatever, and you're on your own. So the expedition leader who's on a bike will say, say, OK, I'm leaving at nine o'clock. If you want to leave before him, that's fine. Uh, the truck, the support truck driver will say, I'm leaving at 10 o'clock and you're free to leave between those two you're free to leave before or after but if you leave after the support truck you're on your own if you go off the route which is also fine um, you're also on your own and you ride with who you want some days i rode with with some guys some days i rode with other guys and some days i rode on my own so the fact that it's a big group is largely irrelevant other than it gives you access to lots of different people to to mix with so we set off. I'm not going to talk at all about what seems strange, because in a way this would be a tour um, in itself for, for most of us. It would have been a great tour for me um, before I'd done something like this. But I'm not going to touch at all. The first part really is just a race across Europe. So 10 days, 11 countries, 2,250 miles. And we get to Istanbul, which is really the first um, first staging point. You get a chance in Istanbul to clean the bikes, check the bikes over. We were there for three days, so you get a chance to rest. But then the trip starts for real as we move into part two and head towards the shores of the Caspian Sea. So heading across eastern Turkey, which itself is an amazing, uh, an amazing experience, very different to the Turkey that I knew uh, or, or had experienced of before from holidays and so on, completely different, much more agricultural, much simpler, um, in a way, much less obviously first world. Anyway, across eastern Turkey, on through Georgia and to Azerbaijan. So in three countries, 13 days, another 2000 miles. Um, and we start to hit the first of what you would think of as the real border experiences. And the scenery starts to change um, hugely. The shot at the top right there is Cappadocia and as are, as indeed are these but we've got a chance to go balloon flying in Cappadocia I, I've worked in the travel industry for more than 20 years and that the balloon flying in Cappadocia is probably the first time I can think of where mass tourism actually adds to the experience because to be in the sky with all those balloons at once is uh, is just incredible 
got to see the whirling dervishes. Very, very interesting thing, completely mesmerizing and absorbing, very spiritual um, experience. Although I have to say it was slightly spoiled by seeing one of the whirling dervishes outside the back of the hall afterwards having a quiet fag. Um, along the way through this stage, I, I, this is where I felt I really got into the trip and I had something of an epiphany. I have a very good friend, a German guy who uh, used to be a, a bike instructor at the Nürburgring. And he once said to me, you know, you're an OK rider, but you'll never be any good as long as you insist on listening to music while you ride. And from that day until this particular day, pretty much I'd stopped doing it. And I was riding through eastern Turkey on my own, middle of nowhere, quite a nice road and a beautiful day. And actually, by mistake, on the sat now, I must have hit the hit the button and the music started to play. And it was a status quo song. And the, these are the words from it. So it's called The Party Ain't Over Yet. And it just said, let the devil do his worst, but don't take any bets. But life's finally quenched my thirst. The party ain't over yet. And for me... That was when the, the trip really started of you throw yourself into this. So we get we get out into more and more rural Turkey. You start to meet people that are fascinated by what you're doing and where you're going. You know, the age old thing of language is no, uh, no barrier. And it was leaving Turkey to go into Georgia that we had our first border incident where the thing they're most paranoid about are drugs. So they will go through, they went through everybody's luggage. They're quite friendly, weren't aggressive at all, but they went through everybody's luggage, unpacked everybody's toiletries and medicine kits, and they they won't let you have anything that uh, is not either over the counter. You can't take codeine and paracode or things like that, even if they are over the counter. They won't let you have anything that you haven't got a prescription for. And long story short, one of the guys had some codeine left over from a previous trip where he'd hurt himself um, in his wash bag and he was at the border for nine hours. Eventually they managed to get a, a photocopy or an, a photocopy of um, the prescription emailed to him but I suspect if he hadn't he'd have still been there uh, still been there now. We've managed to go to see Star Stalin's birthplace and then we arrive in Tbilisi very cool city and um, very cosmopolitan and quite a nice, nice place just to chill out after the few days of getting a little bit more out there. But we move on quite quickly uh, into Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan border. Good luck. <laughs> it's, again, very interesting uh, country, the home of the racing larder. So you see the bottom left photo. These things are everywhere. And I tell you, they take some keeping up with the way that those boys, um, those boys drive them. But I'd, we'd hoped for a couple of days in uh, Baku, but we, we checked into the hotel and within two hours we checked out again, heading straight to the ferry. Um, if anybody has watched the, um, the Globebusters series um, about the first time they did this adventure, I think it's called The Ride. You can see it on uh, Amazon Prime. The ferry is something of a, um, I'm not sure if you call it a highlight, but it's, it's a focal part of the, uh, of the trip. And we, got, we went straight to the ferry. It's a 24 hour crossing. They're not really passenger ferries. They're freight ferries. You can't pre-book. Um, you can wait days to board, you can wait days in the harbour to offload, and the only thing that really talks is cash. We were lucky, we got on uh, the same day, um, no cabins, so we slept um, between the seats, um, we made our own bar, um, it was pretty tough actually, I was, even I was reduced to drinking Jack Daniels, uh, which is not my favourite drink, but we crossed we arrived at the other side and then you get to the stands and the fabled Silk Road, which starts with landing in Turkmenbashi in Turkmenistan. Now, I've been to some strange places in my time. I say I've worked in the travel industry for 20 odd years, but this one takes the biscuit. It was a Soviet satellite until 1991. It has got phenomenal 
gas and oil wealth. And it is a total, um, an absolute dictatorship. Very, very strange country full of contrasts. Um, this is just a shot of, of the harbour. Um, we docked at two o'clock. We finally managed to get off the ferry at about five o'clock in the afternoon. And we were eight hours in customs and immigration. They weren't obstructive. They weren't unhelpful. They, it, they were great. It's just incredibly bureaucratic and, um, and slow. But we had a couple of days in Ashgabat, which is a really crazy place. You can see these, these statues. Everything in Ashgabat is the world's largest, the world's biggest, the world's only. The one in the top right hand corner, believe it or not, is the world's largest indoor Ferris wheel. You've got all of these things. The, the city was flattened in 1948 by a huge earthquake and it was rebuilt in almost entirely in white marble. But one of the things you'll notice, perhaps you know, the two central photos give you the best sense of it, there are no people. It's a really strange, uh, really strange place, really strange place. But a couple of days there, we get to move on and now we move out into the into the Karakum Desert and we're heading to Darvatsa. Absolutely terrible, terrible road, broken tarmac. And for the first time probably ever in my riding career, actually rode on the gravel alongside of it by choice because it was state, it was more stable and uh, and less, less, frankly, less scary. Saw our first camel and you'll see in the one of the middle photos at the bottom there. Uh, sinkholes. The place is full of these huge sinkholes. And what we were heading for is this Darvatsa crater. So we had the last 400 metres before we got to our campsite in sand. Last beer in the evening sun you see in the left hand photo. And then you see in the top right hand photo, the sky begins to uh, go dark. And like really dark and really heavy and threatening and then it started to spin up a dust storm and so on it's at this point that we learned that the tents are actually basically two pound fifty argos um uh, festival tents everybody everybody puts their waterproof clothing on leaps back to the tent and waits for the storm to pass over and boy was it a storm but it passed and the the sky cleared and that allowed us to go and visit the Darvatsa crater, which is known locally as the door to hell. In 1971, Russian drilling engineers were, they were drilling for gas and they they basically, they were excavating this thing. It's 70 meters diameter, it's 30 meters deep. Um, and they, they inadvertently, they were drilling for oil, sorry, and they inadvertently hit gas. And this gas started coming off and some bright spark said, well, let's just set fire to it and it'll burn off. So they set fire to it in 1971. And it's been burning like that ever since. It's extraordinary. The pictures don't really do it justice. It looks like it's just a little bit hot, but this thing has got leaping flames uh, all over it. Amazing experience. And actually, in the dark and with the heat and after the storm and all those things, actually quite spirit, spiritual experience, but an amazing place. So we leave Turkmenistan behind uh, and move into one of one of my favourite countries from the trip, actually, uh, Uzbekistan, as beautiful as Turkmenistan. It was crazy. And this starts to look much more like the Silk Road um, of legend. And these photographs are in the first first of the Silk Road cities, Kiva. Um, these are in the next one, Bukhara. And you, as you can see, you know, the, the interiors of some of these places are, are pretty spectacular uh, too. Most of this built back in the 1400s by Tim, uh, Tamerlan the Great. But the history there goes back even earlier, e even before Alexander the Great. It's the oldest continuously occupied city um, in Central Asia. Yeah, that's uh, Samarkand. So just uh, history uh, everywhere. Extraordinary. The only thing that is cra even crazy, though, though, in that country is the money, the SOM. So you see the, the central invoice there. 
that was for um, dinner for six of us, and it was 284,000 some. And the photograph on the right, when all 20 of us went for dinner, we took the money in two holdalls to uh, pay for it. Extraordinary. So, sad to leave Uzbekistan uh, and head off into Tajikistan. Uh, also a very controlled country, but the people much more open than in Turkmenistan. Um, and Tajikistan was one of the places everybody was getting really excited um, about. Three, three highlights. Uh, first, then I'll talk a little bit about the Tunnel of Death and then the Pamir Highway and the, the famous uh, Wakan Valley. So this is the Tunnel of Death the Anzob Tunnel, which allegedly had been uh, resurfaced and had lighting installed. But I can tell you it hasn't been resurfaced and it hasn't got any lighting installed. It is its um, tunnel through which huge articulated coal trucks thunder and they take no prisoners. I was going through in a group of uh, four of us. I thought I'd be smart and go at the back. Halfway through the tunnel, I was overtaken by an articulated coal truck in the face of another articulated coal truck coming the other way. I have never been so glad in my life to emerge at the other end. And as you can see from the uh, faces of my two mates, you get bloody dirty in there. You absolutely filthy. Anyway, through the tunnel of death to uh, the capital, Dushanbe which is where the bikes all get prepped for the off-road stretches. So there are no dealers or anything like that. We you carry all your own servicing parts. We took uh, tyres with us for all the bikes in the support truck and in Dushanbe, all the knobbly tyres and so on uh, get fitted. Crew were brilliant though. They did all the work, 99% well, of the work uh, for us. And as we head out of Dushanbe, what we're really heading down to is the Wakan Valley. So on here, the the pink line is the Pamir Highway that most people that cross um, Tajikistan will take. But we took the, the loop down on the yellow um, line down into the Wakan Valley, which follows the Panj River and the border with Afghanistan. And again, an area rife with history. This is the, the part of the world where the great game in Victorian times was played out between the British, the French and the Russian empires as they jockeyed for position uh, around China and India and what eventually became Pakistan and so on. So it's, it's littered with um, amazing history. And we set off the first places that we're stopping is a town called Korog. And you start to feel quite a lot like Eastern Turkey, actually. Um, this, but this has had a big build up. But the first half of, of the road uh, was really easy. You can see the weather was was beautiful. The scenery was great. The people, again, fabulous. And, it, you know, we start to climb into the mountains, but it's all very civilised. The road starts to get a little bit broken up, but nothing difficult at all local checkpoints because it's the afghan border there are lots of soldiers walking marching patrolling the roads and so on but fantastically uh, fantastically friendly interested again you know get the maps out where have you come from where are you going great uh, experience and then into the wakan valley itself and it starts to get a little bit more uh, interesting this was the first time we'd come across anything that looked like deep um, sand and it was on this stretch of the road that we broke the support truck. One of the um, one of the suspension units in the front of the truck actually snapped and the support truck had to leave us. Had to go back to Dushanbe to get fixed and we had to hire a local four by four. So at least we had some backup. Uh, but it gives you an idea of how what the roads are like if it breaks that big four by four Mercedes truck. Again, you can see now as we're heading out towards Korog. At this point, I would have said that this was my best ever day uh, on a bike. It was 140 miles. It was all gravel. Um, across the river there is Afghanistan. And this is where the little Honda started to come into its own. 
in truth, flogging across Europe to Turkey on a, on a CB500 with a bunch of people on 1200 GSs and Tigers, it's hard work. And on the tarmac stretches like that, in truth, I was always amongst the last to uh, arrive. But you're getting into this where your bike is 60, 70 kilos lighter than everybody else's. And now you start to see why, uh, why you did it. This is the little town of Korog. Beautiful, no tourists really, a couple of little uh, guest houses, but tourists very unusual, certainly Western tourists, pretty unusual. Um, good chance again to check the bikes. And by this stage, the BMWs were starting to fall apart. So we, um, we got to the point where we, we spent a couple of days checking over the checking over the bikes, re ready now for the proper push down into the um, down into the Wakam Valley and the road out of Korog. So the road in, it was, it was getting a bit more challenging, but the road out starts to get seriously uh, challenging. Fortunately, because this was not long after we'd set off, we were pretty much all together. But as you can see, the second, the second sand trap was, uh, was carnage. Fortunately, again, the weather, the weather was great. And actually, it became quite good fun, to be honest, helping everybody, um, helping everybody through. But now you start to get into some of the the really great scenery. This are, these photos are of um, a place called the Yamchun Fortress, and the mountains that you see behind the top right photo that's the Hindu Kush. So you rode up um, sort of gravel single track, pretty pretty steep, but but not nothing. You took took the luggage off the bikes to make to make it easier to um, do. Got up and one walked across to the fortress, and again, amazing experience. Essentially, you can look out across those mountains, across the Hindu Kush, across yeah. Afghanistan, and into. Uh, into Pakistan, it's just fantastic, and it's so easy to imagine what was going on in the in the great uh, during the days of the great game. And this is where we were aiming for. Probably the simplest homestay of anywhere we went. Uh, very simple, very hospitable, and best of all, the beer was great and very welcome. But you get a sense of how simple it was. That was our bath in the bottom left-hand corner. Those were our bedrooms that we were sharing. Uh, at the top but it was fabulous and actually this day subsequently became the best uh, the best day um, ever on a bike even the dinner of plov which is basically rice and anything that looks vaguely like meat and fat and stuff boiled up into a into a big stew even that couldn't spoil the day now the road from korob to langar that was nothing this is the road out of uh, out of the town of Langar, and now you start to get some really fantastic uh, mountain scenery and properly out there. Yeah, this the only people out there are, are goat herds and so on. In the bottom right hand corner, another checkpoint though. There are still checkpoints because you're still fairly close to Afghanistan, so they're checking vehicles and so on. But most of the time. There are no vehicles, and they're amazed to see um, to see Western tourists. And we're heading to a place called Murgab, um, and I'll just give you try and give you a sense with this little video of what the road's actually like. Anybody else not seeing the video? Okay. 
apologise for the music and the editing, but that's uh, that's GoPro rather than me. The, um, the, you've got about 75, maybe 80 miles uh, of that. But again, as you can see, amazing um, weather. Imagine doing that in the rain. The group that did it two years before us, when they did that, it was pissing it down from beginning to end. So I suspect uh, it was a bit more challenging for them than it was for us. But at the end of those 70 or 80 miles, tarmac or sort of tarmac um those 80 miles took sort of five hours to get across because some of it was pretty steep and tricky but at the end you get to this which is actually the pamir highway uh proper again and heading to um Murgab, which is the best way i can describe it it's where mad max lives it's extraordinary the bottom the shot in the bottom left and the bottom right that's the petrol station where these two guys have got the most incredible way of figuring out exactly how much petrol you um, need and have had through a complex series of different size cut off bottles and jugs etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, unbelievably basic hotel um, um, I'll, I'll be honest enough and say that one of the guys was was really happy that he got on this sink in the middle in the bottom photo in his bedroom because he said that's great because it mean I won't need to get up and go if I need a pee in the night I won't need to get up um, and walk down the corridor to the bathroom which he subsequently did he used the sink only to discover that it wasn't plumbed in so we eventually we leave Tajikistan and we cross into Kyrgyzstan and Effectively, I suppose, civilization um, again, but the there's a trick up his sleeve, no man's land. So between the two borders, there is, I think it's something like 18 kilometers of this. And because it's no man's land, literally nobody maintains it. So it is what it is. And as you can see, there's remnants of snow on the ground, there's mud, there's water, there's there's everything. It is it's extraordinary. And then as we get out at the other end, um, you can see in the middle photo there, it snowed. And in fact, I actually fell off in the um, it, it was hail as much as anything, but I actually lost the back end. It only lasted for about 400 yards and I lost it in the middle. Uh, but eventually we get to another homestay, the bottom left there, Sari Tash, plov again um, for dinner, but even that failed to put a dampener on proceedings. And we head on from, uh, from Sari Tash onto Osh, where in the Globebusters video of the first time they did this, there were gun battles going on um, on the street. It was nothing like that when we were there. It was just a beautiful country and, you know, horse herders on the main roads, beautiful animals, beautiful scenery, people you know, living uh, very simple uh, farming lives, tending the horses and so on, and nomadic um, tending of the horses. Uh, again, incredibly friendly. First time at a um, proper um experience with the local police these guys were essentially stopping anybody and everything and attempting to shake people down for uh fines somehow i managed to get away with it because when they demanded driving licenses i didn't give them my uk one which is what they were expecting they kept showing me pink photo card and want, they want to see this and i just gave them a international driving license and in the end the one who was in charge I, I can guess what he said, but it was in the local language. But I think it boiled down to those sod it, just let him go. And so off we uh, off we went. And we actually had a real luxury hotel in Bishkek. As you can see from the middle shot, it was beautiful. Um, oh, the bottom left one is there was for posterity. That was the expedition leader dropping his bike in the car park of the luxury hotel, showing off by trying to hop off it while it was still rolling. Um, and we found a wine shop, a, a really good wine shop, bottom right there, which Steve's wine shop, uh, he was an, a retired policeman from Croydon who opened a wine shop in Bishkek of all places, but that allowed us to stock the expedition truck up, which had rejoined us by now, stock it up for the rest of the trip. Into Kazakhstan, briefly, um, really just to, to, we only went into Kazakhstan to go to Almaty to drop people off. There were three people whose tour was over um here and it's the it's an easy place to get uh, bikes in and out of 
but that was really the only point. But on the way out, we rode out to camp again in this place. It's called the Charin Canyon. You can, in theory, ride down to the bottom, but the road down wasn't really rideable. Chivrezel wasn't rideable by uh, by us, so we were ferried down by four by four. But this time we had a fabulous night um, camping down on the on the floor of the canyon, which really set everybody up nicely for the for the trip out, where we starting now to climb towards the border into China and. The scenery as you start to uh, head towards the Chinese border, just stunning. At this point, it was well below zero as we were riding. It was sort of two or three degrees below zero, but the sky was blue and the scenery um, stunning. We had a very easy exit from Kyrgyzstan, but this is the start of the process of getting into China. This checkpoint is at four and a half thousand metres above sea level. It's two degrees. Um, at this point, and we were waiting there, I would think probably three or four hours before we could even approach the um, the first of the border checkpoints because we weren't allowed to approach the checkpoint until our Tibetan guide had been allowed up from the other side to uh, to meet us. But this is when the expedition truck comes into its own, brewing up soup, brewing up tea, and everyone you know good good humour. So part four of five, Tibet, the roof of the world, the slowest border um, by miles. Um, put this in context. We, so we had three or four hour wait for the government liaison guide. We then rode two miles, endless customs, immigration, vehicle checks, et cetera, et cetera. They finally let us in at 11.30. So we'd probably been, I guess, 12 hours or so beginning to end. But the bikes were impounded. So we're in, the bikes are impounded. Um, we get to stay, though, in the old city of Kashgar, which is um, an old Muslim city or was an old Muslim city. Most of it's been bulldozed by the Chinese now um, and turned into a just an archetypal modern city. But it's the it's the home of the Uyghurs where, the, you know, there's so much um media coverage suggesting that the the way the Chinese are persecuting them. Well, this is this is the centre of uh, Uyghur culture. Um, we had to wait three days um, for the bikes, but in the time, famous people like Connolly and Young Husband, who were big part of the exploration in Victorian times and pl the big players in the great game, this was their embassy. And it's now fabulous restaurant just behind our um, hotel. Um, one night in the hotel, we had the most bizarre experience. We found a floor that wasn't listed on the lifts. And this was it. It was like the holodeck of a Starship Enterprise with a pool table and a karaoke machine, et cetera, et cetera. It was like a whole, it was like an out-of-body experience, I guess. But eventually we're in. You get your Chinese driving license at the top, your Chinese number plate at the bottom, and after three days, we're in and we're off on the road into the Taklaman Desert, uh, heading towards Kuda. Plans for a, a big day of 250 miles, checkpoints, altitude, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the roads and the scenery, boy, do they make up for it. This day, though, this, this is where we were supposed to stop. So we've done 250 miles on rough roads at this stage, but we're told we can't stop at Kuda because there's an army base opposite it and it's occupied. And so no tourists are allowed in the hostel. So no problem, says Kevin, we'll go on to Mazar, which is another 50 miles. Oh, you can't stop there either, says the, uh, says the security guy on the checkpoint. So we have to just keep, keep going. We're pushing 5,000 metres above sea level. We've got to do an extra 130 miles and it turns to gravel. And as you can see, it's threatening to snow and it's starting to go dark. Eventually, we get to the place we're staying, Barracks 34, at 11 o'clock at night, just as it's going dark. And this is Barracks 34 with all the mould and et cetera on the ceiling. I tell you, I have never been... I have never been so pleased to uh, to see somewhere to sleep. The beds were like tables. 
There were fluorescent lights, there was no hot water, but there were electric blankets and inside sit on toilets, slept like babies. So next day we carry on into the heart of Tibet, gaining altitude most of the day, four and a half, five thousand meters uh, high, rarely above freezing. That's the official gateway into uh, into Tibet. And again, beautiful, uh, beautiful scenery and the, the yak, lots of lakes, very cold. Um, so you can see snow on that as a mascot on my bike, snow overnight. This now we also start to develop uh, an issue. One of our number uh, starts to suffer from altitude sickness. So we were going higher. So he was driven out, basically driven out. And the plan was to put him on a plane to uh, Lhasa, uh, just getting down out of the altitude. So we were also now knowing that this was this was serious uh, ship, the altitude. This is the road, another one of the roads. You see the, the truck incident at the bottom left is not uncommon. More of the gravel all taking it in turns to drop uh, drop bikes and so on, off-road diversions, jackknife trucks. This is when we discovered that the BMW 850, that had a particular, uh, particularly interesting thing. It wouldn't start in the mornings. It wouldn't start when it was cold. Tried everything between us, uh, kickstart switch, heating, you know, putting a blanket over it, anything we could think, anything we could think of. Anyway, in the end, somebody said, I think the problem is it can't breathe. And so the crew got an oxygen bottle designed for people out of the support truck, squirted oxygen into it, pure oxygen into the airbox, started first time. And so for the next, I'm not sure, four or five days, the Swedish guy riding it had to carry a bottle of oxygen with him, but not for himself, but, uh, but for the bike. Just more along the way, another incident with the uh, with the policeman in the bottom right there, third brush with the law. And this, if anybody has ridden um, in on the Indian side, lots of uh, operators, tour operators do trips up into the foothills of the Himalaya and often to Pangongso Lake, um, which they talk about being on the border between India and China. Well, this is Pangongso from the other side. Uh, which, it, if anything, actually, it's more beautiful than the Chinese side. You see more of the uh, more of the lake, Lake Manasarova, four and a half thousand meters along this road. We've doing uh, discovered that it seemed to be taking forever, and it turned out there was a twenty five mile an hour headwind. Twenty five mile an hour wind at four and a half thousand meters. I can tell you, a CB five hundred is not the ideal bike. This one, just look at carefully at the, the sat nav in the bottom left hand corner. The reason I stopped and took that was 4,800 meters elevation. 4,800 meters is the height of the top of Mont Blanc. So that bike is at the highest, the equivalent to the highest point in Europe. And look at the mountains around. There are so many mountains over that height, they don't even bother naming half of them. It's, it's amazing. This is uh, one of the stops where we actually had to do self catering. So that's me in the top left with Kevin uh, preparing the preparing the dinner for everybody. On keep go, keep go, uh, moving across across Tibet. Sorry, I've just got a uh, somebody waiting in message in the middle of my screen. So you, now you start to see uh, self service for petrol. So uh, they do it in a very different way. Self service, you have to you do it with watering cans. You're not allowed to take the bikes to the petrol pumps. You fill a watering can and walk all the way across the petrol station with a full watering can of petrol and put it in the bike. Uh, they must believe it's safer. And eventually, you get to what we came to see for this part of the trip. There it is. Everest and some teams get to this place and they never actually see it because of the weather and look at it again with with a good weather group there it is not a cloud in the sky and just to prove it there's me and the Honda we made it again very emotional experience actually just aiming for something for so long uh, we're 10 weeks in I think at this uh, at this stage and you, you know you're pretty pretty tired but the elation is fantastic and this is the road 
to Everest Base Camp. What a road. At one time it was gravel. Now it's fresh new tarmac. I think it was done uh, at the time of the Beijing uh, Olympics, but what just what a road. There's Everest and we get we get to go up to base camp. You park your bikes and you board an electric bus that takes you up to takes you up to the, the tourist base camp. There is a mountaineering base camp further up, but you can only get to that if you've got a mountaineering uh, permit. And then a boring ride, really, a couple of days. I've got no photos or video and no, neither did anybody else of it, which shows you the anticlimax. But this was um, we had a couple of days then to rest and recuperate in Lhasa, which is actually a really cool, uh, cool city. And these are photos of the Patala Palace, the um, home, the official home of the Dalai Lama. And it's a really cool little, really cool little city. Good to be back in civilization bars, restaurants, and this is where Matt, who'd um, been suffering from altitude sickness, he missed out on the trip to Everest, but he was able to rejoin the trip, uh, the trip here. Now, the Tibet Sichuan Highway, um, through a whole bunch of places I'd never heard of, and I suspect most of you will never have heard of. Uh, I might talk a little bit about one of them, Ya'an, uh, briefly uh, in a couple of minutes. But now this is the Tibet Sichuan Highway is listed as one of the world's most dangerous roads, and it's not difficult to uh, to see why. But the scenery is is beautiful, but you start to, it starts to become more gentle. It's much more alpine type scenery, and this is the the views some views around the Lhasa River. Uh, yeah, very. It start you start to get relaxed. Of course, you can start to breathe again because now we're coming we're losing the altitude and so on. But look at the roads. I mean, the Everest road just got bettered. This this road makes the Stelvio Pass look like Tesco's car park. And it just goes on and on and on. And some people at the end of the trip would still say that this was the best uh, the best days riding because of the the roads were just amazing. Look at this. Uh, Matt. So this is this is Matt um, who had the altitude sickness. And this was the Where's Matt day. One of the things you remember the little um, reading note, uh, writing notes that I showed you at the beginning. One of the things they say is read the notes carefully. Don't trust the sat nav. Read the notes. Matt didn't read one of the critical things on the notes, which said when you get to this turning, do not follow the sat nav and turn left. Stay on the road and go through the new tunnel. Otherwise, you will go 40 miles out of your way on a dirt road over the top of the new tunnel. That's what Matt did. When he finally arrived here, it was 10.30 at night, pitch black. He was OK, but I think he was, <laughs> I think he was a, bit, uh, a bit shaken up. Sorry, let me just skip back. And the other thing that happened, uh, Matt's incident, we, the guy in the middle there, uh, little Dave, livestock becoming more and more common on the roads. And we were, we were, we were probably getting a bit of a wiggle on. I think everyone was getting a little bit carried away with the um, with the return to tarmac and low altitude, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, Dave came around a corner and met a yak asleep in the middle of the road. Um, managed to avoid the yak, but put the bike into the concrete barrier at the side of the road, totaled the bike, total complete write off, snapped the forks and uh, broke three ribs. Uh, he was OK, but he said broke three ribs. So that was the end of his trip. In the interest of brevity, I'll perhaps, no, perhaps I will, I'll talk to this, but I, I won't talk about, I won't read all the slides. This was the, the toughest day of the trip in the end. So we learned over breakfast there'd been a landslide and the road we were planning to take was closed. So we rode out to the fork where we were planning to go to check what was going on to discover an immense three-way traffic jam, all these trucks and no way through. So it took mm, four hours, I would guess, to do the first 30 or 40 miles. Uh, and then what we get is uh, the road just peters out. So this is Dom, who's the expedition leader, who's been around the corner to see what's going on. These two local ladies are saying it's perfectly passable. You, you, can, you can ride it. Dom comes back and says you can't ride it on a quarter ton adventure bike with uh, with laden panniers. So the only thing we've got, got to do is we've got to take a diversion. And unfortunately, the diversion. Uh, no, I'll let me skip it on. The diversion is 120 miles of dirt road. With 
warnings of dire consequences uh, of straying from the route because it's across a Chinese military training area. So <laughs> you, we, we different people set off at different uh, times. I was with a couple of guys and we were uh, probably three hours, I think, without seeing anybody else. And you start to wonder, are we on the right road? Are we on the wrong road? And I always remember the sense of relief as we saw Dom, the expedition leader, go past us as we were stopped at a petrol station, which gave us the reassurance we were on the right road. Anyway, this is where that road took us to uh, Mount Ma, which is a, a sacred uh, Buddhist temple. And then the last section, uh, part five across China to Beijing. So this is another 2000 miles, but now you have, we're on the homeward stretch, another 2000 miles, a couple of weeks, no borders, no checkpoints. And the big thing is no motorways, pain of death. You're not allowed on the motorways, no motorbikes on the motorways. Now, this is where you start to see Chinese driving um, in its full glory. It was it was either like Death, Ra Death Race 2000 uh, or for those of you old enough, it was like being in wacky races. Just it's as if there are no there were no rules at all. You, you know, the French thing about priority à droite, this is everywhere any anybody's got whatever priority they uh, want but strangely you see relatively few accidents but the most interesting thing is all this stuff that those of us that are observers teach and those of us that are associates um are trying to learn it works it's extraordinary it actually does work even in the middle of death race 2000 this stuff about information vision, particularly work and the definition of hazards about what you can see, what you can't see and what you might reasonably or in China's case, unreasonably expect to happen. It really hones your uh, really hones your senses. And the scale of construction in this part of China is mind boggling. You might have heard the, the, the thing where they say that I can't remember, you know, one in three of all the cranes in the world are in Dubai. I have to say that is clearly complete and utter nonsense the, the just i can't begin to describe the scale of the construction that you see apparently they th at the moment they're tarmacking the equivalent of the uk every year not the equivalent of the uk road network the equivalent of the whole of the uk and they poured more concrete in the last three years than the us poured in the 20th century and the pace of construction is increasing and they just Roads just end. So we were going along, we were going along a six lane highway and it just ends. And you just got to, you know, fiddle your way around through the, through the roadworks uh, at the end. But along the way, you get to see some pretty cool stuff. This is the the, um, the giant Buddha, Beijing. Um, I think that's Pingyao, the ancient walled city of Pingyao. Um, that's cycling around the city walls in the rain. Giant Panda Research Centre at Chengdu, uh, which is a fabulous uh, thing to visit. They've learned huge amounts of, uh, about the giant pandas and now they're working on um, relocation back into the wild uh, projects. And that's quite a special place. We went to Shan, saw the terracotta army. It's worth a presentation all of its own. And we even got to see <laughs> see some uh, Sichuan opera, uh, Bian Lian, called Changing Faces. But as you can see from the photo on the right, not everybody was particularly impressed by it. Uh, and you can get, you can eat ugh, anything. A anything is on is available on a stick. I'm not even sure what some of those things uh, are. The the dish there in the middle at the bottom is tripe served over dry ice. Don't ask me why they serve it over dry ice, but that's what it is. They bring it to the table and it's um, steaming more food on sticks. Uh, you can have you can have your ears cleaned by a man in the street. Uh, there's no limit to what you can pay money for in some of these uh, places. But along the way, what we're really seeing is is industrial China now in I'm not sure glory is quite the right word, but industrial China in all its glory. And it's like Victorian Burnley, but on a but on a whole different scale because we're not allowed on the motorways you, you've got to travel on the um, on the local roads we spent three days in this traffic jam 
passing queues of these are coal trucks basically and literally three days with them in in both directions not we weren't stuck in the well occasionally we were stuck in the traffic as you can see at the bottom but generally you can get past it but look how dirty it is it was filthy and that you know that's what you look like at the end of uh, at the end of a, a day's ride the only way to get clean is to in your full kit get in the shower but eventually we get through it and we arrive at the wall and again this is a place called Shifosi where you've got direct access to the the great wall fabulous mind-boggling thing to to see and to finish with just the, the scale I know we've we've all read about it and seen it on the telly but to actually see it is really quite uh, really quite something and then we gather all together for the last ride in convoy into uh, into beijing and we arrive at the ace cafe so big crowds and greeters some of our fans even turned out with their custom uh, bikes they were extraordinary it was really fabulous they've even got they've got a steam train at the, uh, you can see at the back there at the uh, the Ace Cafe in Beijing, but after three th three months, three thousand miles, an amazing sensation. Um, we made it. We made it. It was it was a, just a, a fabulous, uh, fabulous, fabulous experience. I'm not going to answer these. I, I, I'll, perhaps I'll skip to the end and, and take questions. But you know what I what I've got here are just a few slides that just you know it's the most common questions people want to know about bikes, kit, lessons, highlights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But rather than me give you my answers, now, let me finish there and sort of say, hopefully see see some of you uh, out on the road less travelled. I'll stop there, but I'm I'm more than happy to take questions and even flip, flip back to some of the answers on the slides, uh, if you like. I could talk for twice as long about it, and I hope that in racing through it like that, I haven't failed to do an amazing trip justice. Thanks, Rose. Uh, Richard, stunning. I, I, I can't tell you. Uh, I mean, uh, as I said to you before we started, Tibet is one of the places I've dreamed about uh, going. That was just amazing. I could I could have listened to you for hours, actually. It was stunning. <laughs> I could talk about it for hours. Absolutely stunning. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, so I, I'm not entirely sure how this works, but I'm going to assume that Jerry, our technical wizard, will make it happen. If anybody would like to ask um, any questions, um, please um, put your hand up and Jerry will um, un, uh, unlock you, as it were. Um, and I'm just going to ask one question, if I may. Um, were there any women on the trip? And, and if there were, how difficult was it for them? There, there were. There were, um, there were three, but only ever two at any time. Um, so there were a couple on a 1200 GS couple, uh, from Australia that um, they would be late 50s, early 60s. Um, and they rode from London as far as Almaty, so through the Wakan Valley and so on, but stopped. They originally lived in Almaty. That's why they wanted to stop there. They, they they were fine. Some of the riding was pretty challenging for two up. And Pam, Len was riding, Pam was uh, pillion. So in some of it, she would ride in the support truck. We had um, one lady rider, so a, a couple both riding. Um, she coped the same as the rest of us. You know, she she rode ev rode everything, managed everything. She was pretty pretty intrepid, and I think in in truth, Rose, I think it's tough. It's tough for the girls. You know, some of the the places are pretty basic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and whilst everybody, you know, will do what they can, and you know, what we in in like the the homestay in um, Langar, you reorganise so that everybody, you know, we we had bods sleeping on the floors and so on, so that Kevin and Kay could have a have a room. Mm. But you know, at the end of the day, they still got to ride the same roads and eat the same food and all that kind of um, stuff. And then we had a, a third um, lady joined us. Towards the end, she was the girlfriend of Matt who had the altitude sickness and she rode on the back with uh, him. But we were sort of in civilization by then. Cool. Um, Jerry, I don't know if you can unlock um, Richard's um, camera because we can't uh, see him. Um, and if anybody would there like. Oh, there you go. Perfect. And if anybody would like to ask Richard any questions, please speak now. Forever hold your peace.
I've got uh, Mick Grundy. Jerry, are you going to? I'm not sure how to do it, so I'm not going to try. Yeah, I think I'm unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Go ahead, well, Rashid, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. That, was, that was an absolutely brilliant presentation. Thank you. You know, a great story. Um, something I'd like to do one day. One thing you mentioned right at the start, you said the, the rules were no top boxes. Um, yeah. what, why is that? What have I missed? Uh, two, two reasons. Um, one is the, the view is if you need a top box, you've got too much stuff. And okay. with some, with, with in, in some of the roads, you really don't want a lot of weight on the bike. You, you're putting undue stress on the bike. And all the weight in the wrong place. So the only the only bike that had a top box, you're allowed a top box if you're riding two up. Okay. But it's basically you don't you, you don't need all that shit. Is the right. is the real mantra. <laughs> Fair enough. Understood. Okay. I guess the only problem is obviously with the two panniers, you're a bit wider filtering through all the traffic in uh, Beijing, right? But yeah, no, exactly, yeah. exactly. So so you, you just but you get you, you get used to it by then. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Were you ever scared? That's another question I have, if I may. Ever scared? Yeah, were you ever scared? Did you ever get to the point where you think, "What the hell am I doing?" Oh, I think you get you get to the point of of um, what the hell am I doing? The, the the toughest day, probably there was the trepidation of the day when we had the 120 dirt mile deviation through the Chinese military area. But yeah. that's in truth. By then, you're so used to riding off road. The riding was okay. That's just more the general thing about being caught by the Chinese soldiers or whatever. Yeah. And that, I suppose that's just foreigners' anxiety. The toughest day was the one where they wouldn't let us stop at yeah. the planned base, and sure. it was that was a high mountain gravel gravel switchbacks, and it was going dark. And then mm. you really are thinking, what the hell am I doing here? Fortunately, right. okay. as it went, as it actually went properly dark, we got to the top of the mountain, and the and the road on the far side had been tarmacked. Wow! So that was a bit of a thank you God moment. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the, the gods were smiling on you exactly. by, uh, with the wet, the weather, and everything else. I exactly. think it could it could have been a lot worse. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mick and um, Phil. Hi Richard. Hi Phil. Yeah, great talk. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, uh, bikes. Uh, you told talked about these old-fashioned BMW things. More interested in the Ducati. How did that fare? So if you, um, I'll leave that up and people can read it. The, the thing about uh, the Multistrada, um, there, there towards the bottom of the right hand end, it boiled its clutch dry twice. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. It boiled boiled the brakes. Um, right. It Matt dropped it on that when he when he um, went wrong over the um, over the tunnel, and that he hadn't he hadn't got bark busters or anything on it. It just got the standard Multistrada um, yeah. uh, handguards, and they essentially when you drop it, they just dissolve. So it, it it took like two hours of gaffer tape and. Um, uh, tape, cable ties and everything to get it back together again, but it made it. It made yeah. it. It's good to hear. Yeah, mine's pretty armoured up to be honest. So uh, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about the um, Royal Enfield brought the Himalaya out. Yeah. Um, obviously, you were on a Honda Honda um, 450. Uh, pretty good things have been said about that. I wonder if anybody's ever taken one since your expedition. Um, there. I, I, I rode I rode a Himalayan on the Indian side of the Himalaya at fair, at fair degree of altitude, and it's a, a, a for that job a remarkably good and tough bike. Yeah. But it's you know I mean it's only 24, 25 horsepower, so it's got half the horsepower of the Honda, and I thought I felt the Honda altitude was struggling. I think the key thing with the Himalayan when I rode that, everybody was on them. So you don't notice the fact that you know you're all going at the same pace. That the 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 challenge with the with the Honda was everybody else had more uh, a lot more power. It coped it coped remarkably well. If I if I was if I was going again on my own, I would take it without hesitation. It was the only bike apart from to be fair to BMW, there was one brand new 1250 GS which had not a single problem. 
But apart from that, the Honda was the only bike with no mechanical problems. The twelve the twelve hundred GSs just had a litany of we had two two rear suspension failures, we had one front suspension failure, and you can't replace the front suspension in the field. It's got to go. To, it's got to go to a dealer. The poor bloke had to ride twelve hundred miles on gravel with no front suspension. So I, I, you know, you pay your money, you, you take your choice. It's a tough, it's a tough trip for bikes, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, all, all the bikes got to the end, apart from the one that Dave wrote off in the in the concrete barrier, and you can hardly blame the bike for that. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else? I was going to say, if nobody's going to ask any questions, it might be helpful. I mean, what about kit and clothing? Because you must have had every single um, kind of weather um, to, to cope yeah. with, didn't you? Yeah. So I, I, I it worked it worked well. So I took I had a, a climb Badlands suit. So you know, expensive, tough, laminated Gore-Tex with lots and lots of vents. It was brilliant. It was good. At, it was completely weatherproof. It, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty well vented. So even in the, we had everything from minus four or five to thirty-eight plus thirty-eight in China. It's okay when you undo all the vents if you're moving, but it's not much use when you're not moving. And the, but the worst, I would not take take the same suit again. The the worst thing about it is when you wear a suit for three for three months. Let's face it, it gets smelly. And I'm not sure I want to trust my, you know. Two thousand pounds or whatever it was, Gore-Tex suit to a hotel laundry in Turkmenistan. So the best it gets is a sluice under the shower, which makes it look cleaner, but it doesn't really stop it being smelly. And at the end of three months, it gets a bit depressing. So if I were doing it again, I would take I would take a washable, non-waterproof suit and a decent rain suit. You know, like a, a, a you know, I don't know, a, a GS, a, you know, a GS rally suit or something like, or something like that, and a decent rain suit over the top. The rest of the kit was was great. Though. You know, um, the the one, the other thing that I would say was a lifesaver was heated vest. Mm. Yeah, difficult to get a heated jacket in, particularly given the no top box rule. But heated vest you can sneak in just about. Mm -hmm. And over in Tibet, you've got you know, merino base layers, heated vest down jacket big jacket over the top and it's still it was still cold wow and what about getting your bikes back again what, so i um, mean or did you just leave them there and no, they, come, they come back by sea so they were collected from the ace cafe trucked out to the port they i think it took about maybe about eight weeks for them to come back and they end up back at a freight handler at heathrow and they were fine I mean, they were still dirty, but they, yeah. but, they were, uh, but they were fine. And it's all included, you know, Globebusters organise all of that. I can't, I can't speak highly enough of their organisation. It's almost like all you have to do is turn up and ride. Wow. Um, anybody else got any, any questions? You're all very quiet tonight, Richard. I'm beginning to wonder if they're there. <laughs> oh, there you go, Mick's back. Go, Mick. Oh, hello. Yeah, sorry, I'm mute. Um, yeah, well, the first thing I was going to say, I've got a comment. What about Febreze? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Anything like that, trawling the, trawling the supermarkets for anything you can find like that. Trouble, <laughs> trouble is when, it, when the writing's in Chinese, you know, you're not quite sure what it is you've bought. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd take a bottle with you. <laughs> yeah, you need I'd, a top box then. Oh, uh, yeah. I get stra strap it somewhere on the bike. No, I was, my question was, uh, and you've got it highlighted here, but I'm, I'm, I, I feel the need to ask, what next? What after doing that? That seems pretty, you know, box ticking, yeah. you know, bucket listy. What, what, what else can you do? Yeah, so it, it's definitely given me, given me the appetite um, for it. it. It, it's very different being away for so long, and mm. it's always, it, it becomes, it's like your job. You know, your job is get up, pack. Yeah. Ride, ride to another place and you become like a little um community and it's very different from being you know going away for a couple of weeks where you know the first week you're winding down and the second week you're winding up to 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 go home so i want to do it again i had i was due to go on a globebusters trip at the back end of this year september through december mm -hmm. in south america riding from um 
Colombia down to Patagonia, which yep. is that's actually only half of a trip. So the full trip is from Alaska all the way down to Patagonia. It takes five months. Okay. Um, but it's but not surprisingly in the current uh, yep. climate, it's been cancelled. But I am booked and hoping to go on the um, London to Bangkok trip in 2022 which um follows a very different route to east it goes across russia and across mongolia right and then down a few days are, are the same actually across the center of china and then down uh, across laos and uh, thailand okay yes yeah, so that's, that's, that's my next and, I, and i've transferred my booking for <laughs> that was supposed to be south america i've transferred that to 2023 one of these trips has got to happen yeah, damn right Okay, no, that's that's good. And and actually, a better question might have been what what was before. So rather than what next, what did you do before this ride? Did you kind of prepare yourself for if you're doing like you know distance riding or off road? Yeah, or I think you, you've got to be. Stuff? I I travelled I, I travelled and ridden in in I suppose in some quite far flung places. You get a bit blasé about it, don't you? So I'd ridden I'd done the Dalton Highway, for example, all the way up to the Arctic with three mates unguided um uh-huh. i'd ridden i used to work in south africa so four of us flew back down there and we rode from cape town to victoria falls again unguided yeah um but those are sort of you know two two and a bit week trips yeah. i'd done a done some off-road riding in iceland um and then lots of you know like lots of us lots of european touring so I, I, I'm used to being in the saddle, and I think that the biggest thing you need to do a trip like this, you need to be you need to be ride fit. You don't need to be a great rider. You know, you, know, you need to be you need to be competent. You need to be a competent road rider, and you need to have some experience of what it is like to ride off road. But I yeah. don't think you need to be. Not just you don't need to be a skilled. You don't really need to be a, a, a full on experienced off-road rider i mean i i did the bmw off-road skills school but yeah. seven or eight years ago i did a few days trail riding in spain three or four years ago i did i, I did the um the trip around iceland was sort of 60 percent, i guess gravel that was probably three years before i went on this trip so apart from trying to be generally fit and bike ready i didn't do any specific preparation and, and like i said at the beginning I, I i meant when i said it if i can do it you know i'm a, I'm a 60 year old bloke you know used to driving and not driving a desk if i yeah. can do it you know and I, I actually i was one of the younger ones on the trip put it in context one of the riders didn't talk about him jim an ex-bbc cameraman retired guy he'll be mm, probably the wrong side of 65 he mm. did it. he's only got one leg <laughs> wow amazing yeah yeah no that's 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 very interesting as you say I, I can see that you know it is as you say about being bike fit I mean I've done sort of you know all my stuff's really been on tarmac I've done like two weeks in Canada yeah uh, which was great and that's more like some of that but I think from for me thinking about it, it's just some of the more not extreme off roads that's not that's not really extreme you know I've done like the, the, I've done the Mick Exton school and that's extreme off road yeah. But it only lasts twenty minutes, and you can stop and have a breather. Exactly. You know, not- this, you know, you, nobody's putting you under any, any any pressure to, you know. I, I suppose the weather puts you under pressure. It's going dark puts you under a bit of pressure. But it, generally, the pace yeah. is very well managed. It, it's, um, you know, when, when you get out into the tough places, it's very well managed. So that after you know, you think three or four days of this, I could really do with a bath or whatever. And lo and behold, you eventually arrive in a city where you can have a bath. Right. Yeah. It's really well. And it gets, they break you into it quite quite cleverly. So, you know, the days get a bit longer and tougher after you, as you go on. But at the beginning, you, they give you more instructions. You, you're, you're very well shepherded without realising that you're being shepherded until until it's clear that you can be trusted, so to speak. It's, it's very, very, I can't speak, I can't, I genuinely can't speak highly enough of, of, of the Globebusters team. And Kevin Sanders is he's a leader of men i tell you or leader of people perhaps in this day and age but you know when the going gets tough and you he, he, he has some great sayings like you know you need to remember uh, where we are this might be a shithole but it is the best shithole in town you know it's 
<laughs> just little, you know, he knows when to put the humour in. He knows when to read people the riot acts. They keep a very careful eye on particular altitude, people dehydrating and their ride going bad and all that kind of stuff. They're very good. They're not just fun people to to travel with. They take it seriously, and you always feel you're in good hands. Yeah, and that's 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 very important. I think, as I say, apart from the fun aspects, it's knowing that. And this is what you get with, as you say, good leaderships, you know, like the Mick Exton stuff that I've done, you know, he's very good at, he, he you know, he rides the Paris Dakar. Yeah, I've ridden, I've ridden he, with Mick. Yeah, and I think he's brilliant because he can get people who aren't that good at riding bikes, riding a lot better in a short space of time yeah. and without feel inadequate. Because I, I guess, you know, again, you look at some of that off-roading stuff thinking, wow, this is like Paris Dakar stuff. But if you haven't got that time pressure, which yeah. I think until that, that one time when you said you were near the military base and you had to keep going but all the other times you're you know you go, okay we've got a long time to get from here to here so yeah, we don't have to exactly. rush it and you've always you know you've always got the fall back of the support truck if you need it the support truck's big enough to put a couple of bikes in if it comes to it right i've got a couple of other people queuing nick shut up then thank shut you up, very much. Uh, you can come back in but uh, dave elsden you had your hand up and you put your hand down again mate where are you dave you, you can unmute yourself, Dave, if you want to go ahead. It's gone to make the tea. Where'd he go? Dave, unmute yourself. It's going so well. We can't hear you, Dave, and you're muted. Should we go on to John? Should we go to John? Yeah, jo um, John, um, John Guest. I don't know. Who... There you go, John. You, you should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, hi, Rose, Jerry. Uh, John Bennett. Um, oh, I hello, just... John. Hi, yeah. Uh, uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Richard. I just wanted to endorse your point about uh, the, the high quality of um, planning uh, and and leadership that goes in into Globebusters. I, I've done five uh, trips uh, with them. Oh, wow. Yeah, Dalton Highway, Alaska was, was the yeah. first, and then and, uh, and, and Patagonia, Chile, Argentina, Peru, Colombia, etc. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to uh, think about doing an overseas trip, uh, no higher praise uh, than, uh, than you, 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 you've given to uh kevin and, and julia just 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 fantastic um also uh just a personal level uh i recognize jim from the uh one of one of your photographs he was on the okay. left -hand side yeah. uh jim i traveled uh, all the way down uh to mali uh and uh, in, into mali uh and and then uh, back from from dakar uh so uh, yeah we <laughs> we shared we shared that journey um so they, six weeks was uh, i think my maximum for for both alaska and north america uh and and uh down through africa to mali uh so uh, yeah but uh for that reason um that was quite enough for me i, I wouldn't have wanted to have done the whole beijing trip uh but uh in terms of family my son has <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i mean interestingly i Normally, at the end of a sort of two or three week trip, or even in four, I've done one four week trip, I'm ready to go home. At the end of this, I could have carried on. Mm. You know, originally it was planned to go all the way to Tokyo, but nobody, there weren't enough people wanting to do it, so they cancelled that bit of it. But I was, I was, I was sad when it came to an end. Yeah, great to see you, your family, and all that kind of, and all those things. Of course it is, but actually, I was, I, I was, there was, it took me quite a long time to get to get back into normal life. Yes, yes. I'd also endorse your point about being bike fit as as distinct from any other uh, skill. Uh, that That's the thing, because if you're not, you get very tired and that's when things go wrong. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. And I think that's you know, be, be just generally being as fit as you can. I don't mean going down the gym and turn yourself into you know, uh, man mountain or whatever. Just being generally fit but bike fit is is the real key as you say you know you get 200 mile day in in heavy chinese traffic you don't want to be tired yeah yeah very good thank you again cheers 
Well, I've just had a message from Dave to say his question was actually answered, which is uh, <laughs> you did you did that by magic. Rich. By magic, exactly. Have we got anybody else who'd like to ask any any questions? I can't see any other hands. Um, it's nearly nine o'clock, which is uh, longer than we normally go for. Richard, um, it falls to me to say thank you so very much. That was, Welcome. I mean, for me um, personally, uh, just t t the thing about Tibet, I could have listened to um, <laughs> hours. Fabulous. Um, so thank you so very much for, for you know, that kind of random connection uh, with yeah. the, daughter of my next door but one neighbour um, to introduce is just kind of it's weird how it works isn't it yes. that really was such an interesting talk thank you so very much you're welcome nice um, everybody good and, to see you all yeah and thank you everybody for coming along to listen in and if any of you've got any ideas for future talks um please do let me know but um in the meantime you know round of applause thank you so much um richard um, Thank you, Richard. Um, if, if the next time you do a trip, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll pre-book you to do the post-ride tour. Sounds like sounds like you need to get John on the case. He's been to more places than me. Well, actually, it's a bloody good point, John. Yeah. Give me a phone number. I'm going to book you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Guys, thank you. For, thank you all thank very, you very much. much. Thank you thank so you, much. Richard. Take good care. Thank you, everybody. Good evening and see you at the next one.